thank you. Good morning. So as she said, my name is Rick Snyder. I'm an EMITH certified business coach. And we'll talk more about what that actually means. And I've been working with um, businesses around the world, many different industries. But the one that keeps gravitating towards me is the world that you guys are in. The worlds of photography, videography, digital arts, commercial arts. And one of my biggest passions is, is really helping people with their passion and their artistic gifts and how to actually translate that to profitability, how to translate that to revenue, that they actually can go together. So the, whole, the old adage that you can do your, your passion and your art um, and at the same time not really make money doing that or you can go for the money and not have meaning. We're challenging that and I'm challenging that saying actually how do you find the and between the two? How can you have both meaning and money so that's a lot of what we're going to get into today, is bringing your business into focus. One thing that I notice about a lot of the photography businesses out there, and videography businesses, etc., are they're really good at telling, or I should say, you're really good at telling other people's story. You're really great at capturing someone's story, whether it's their brand, their marketing, um, whatever, whatever medium that you use. That's one of your, your, your best gifts, in my opinion. And the same question goes to yourself is, how good are you at telling your own story? How, are you, how good are you at generating your own, bit, your own vision for your business? And that's really what today's about, is really getting a, another look at uh, and another perspective on what is your story? And what makes you unique and different from your competition? They say the two most important things about marketing are that you have to have something unique. You have to have something that differentiates you from, your, from the crowd. But the other part of that is that that differentiator has to be something that people actually care about. For example, if I invent solar-powered toothbrushes and I'm in the Arctic in the winter, it's different, but it's, people probably don't care about that because the sun doesn't come out, so it's not going to be useful. So that's the thing to start thinking about in the, as I talk about this is, how do you translate this to your business, to your experience? And there's going to be several times where I'm going to open it up to questions. And I really want to help this be more of an engaged experience, not just a lecture. So that's my intention today. OK. So first of all, I'm curious, how many of you have even heard of eMyth before? Show of hands. So just one, about two? OK. So good. And by the way, this is applicable whether your business is a startup, whether you've been doing this for 10, 20 years, um, or somewhere in between, it doesn't matter. The different um, skills and perspectives that you're going to get from today are going to be applicable no matter where you're at in your own business cycle. Okay. <clears throat> so in the, uh, early, in, the, in the mid 80s, Michael Gerber noticed a certain phenomenon with small business in the US. He'd go around and, and he'd notice certain patterns. And he wrote this book called The E-Myth. And what The E-Myth stands for is the entrepreneurial myth. And the myth is that people think it's entrepreneurs that start a business. And what he noticed is it's actually technicians, people who are good at their technical craft, who have an entrepreneurial seizure. And they think that they can do it better, uh, work for, make more money, have more time, have more freedom, when it's usually the opposite when you start a business. And who here has actually started a business? OK. So you probably know what I'm talking about. That sometimes that ideal looks attractive, it looks romantic, but the reality is very different. And so this book came on the scene, in, like I said, in the 80s. But it wasn't until he, re he rewrote this book in 1997, The E-Myth Revisited, where he actually made it a personal story. And he talks about the story of Sarah. She's a, she's a baker, and she makes pies. But she didn't know how to actually run a business, uh, a, a pie business. So even though she knew the technical craft, she didn't know how, how to actually develop her business that way. So what I get from that is the first version didn't really speak to a lot of people because it wasn't connected to a personal story. But in this version, that's what Michael did so well is he recontexted this with someone's story that people could relate to. And so I'm also sharing this for your own minds when you're coming up with your marketing for your business your sales, your lead generation and strategies that you might do, how do you, once again, connect with your story? And that's what's going to reach other people. 
That's what's going to be the difference that makes the difference versus just naming statistics, data of, of your products and services. What's the actual personal story that touches people? That's what makes the difference. So this book went on to sell 7 million copies. It became a, a bestseller. I think on the Inc. the uh, Inc. 500s of CEOs, it was the number one for a while. Uh, recommended book. It's been taught in over 120 universities, including Stanford. So word got around on the street of the e-myth because so many people can relate to this. So it's a philosophy and a business development process that addresses the why, the what, and the how. It encompasses both what to do and how to think about it. And that's really the message of today is how do you, one thing that I want you guys to get from today is one new perspective for your business, one perspective shift. And, and trust me, this is all it can take to completely shift how you relate to your business and the results that will follow. Okay, so this is more about the entrepreneurial seizure that I was talking about. So most people that I meet, most people, most business owners that I coach, I would call reluctant entrepreneurs. They didn't really want to do that, but maybe they were, they were laid off. Maybe uh, they just couldn't stand working for their boss anymore. Uh, whatever the reason is, they kind of started their business, but maybe not from their full choice in some kind of way. They were kind of forced into it or what have you. So once again, most people think that, oh, I'm gonna, if I don't have to work for my boss, I'm gonna do, I can do it better. Can anyone relate to that? Has anyone ever had that thought? I know I have. So you know what? I can do it in a way where I'm gonna make more money, have more time, and have more freedom. <laughs> So this is what we dream of every day in the cubicle, in the office desk, uh, going for a walk to get that coffee break, whatever it is, is, you know, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I can do it better. So this is pretty typical. And once again, here's the entrepreneurial myth. A carp just because I know how to contract and be a carpenter doesn't mean I actually know how to run a, a carpenter and contracting business. Because I'm a, I might be the world's best CPA, but actually not know how to run my business of my accounting firm. Maybe I'm a dancer, um, I'm an artist, whatever I might be, but I don't know how to actually run a dance studio and manage it and have em, deal with employees and marketing and brand, oh my God, where do I start? So this is really the classic e-myth, and if you bring it to your industry, literally you could be the world's greatest photographer but not know how to get your passion and your, your product out there. You might the, be the world's best videographer, uh, commercial arts, digital media, whatever it might be. And still, the world might not know about that. And so what can you do on your side to actually punch through that bubble? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And here is the fatal assumption. Just because you know how to do the work of the business means that you know how to build a business that does that work. That's the assumption. So once again, I might know how to do any technical thing, but it doesn't mean I actually know how to run a business doing that thing, whatever that might be. Can anyone relate to this in what you're doing right now even? Yeah? Okay. Whenever you're engaging in a, with a business coach or a consultant, it's always good to really know what is their perspective, where are they coming from, and is that actually a fit for me? That's something you should always be doing as an informed consumer in any, anything that you, any contractor that you get, any um, consultant that you hire. So we're going to cover some of the grounding principles of e-myth, and, um, and then I want you to be applying them to your business as we go forward. So we're going to cover the three personalities, the seven dynamics, the four roles, and the nine principles. And we're just gonna touch on some of these. We're not gonna go in super depth, because we could we could, I could take one of these and talk for three hours on each one, easy. Okay, this is one of the biggest things that, uh, once again, Michael Gerber noticed when he was going around small businesses. And I don't know if you know this statistic, but in, within five years of a small business launching, 80% of small businesses fail within five years. 80%. So there's something that people are just not getting. Even if they get their MBA, I've met so many people who have their MBA and still don't know how to apply that in real life, in real time. Because it's different, academics are different than the real thing. And too often a lot of programs don't make that bridge. 
And the other uh, complicated thing is when you have a, let's say you're at a university studying your master's in business, and you have you know, 15, 20 different professors, you're often getting 15 or 20 different philosophies or approaches to business. So there's actually no grounding principle or a holistic system of how to actually approach business that's not contradicting itself. Because you're gonna have one professor telling you to do this thing in marketing, one, a completely different strategy for sales, and they're actually not connected. So when people go through the, um, the EMIT program, people say, wow, I feel like I'm getting a real world MBA. This is what I wish I had gotten when I went to whatever school I went to. Okay, so here's the three personalities. And we have each of these, in, all three of these in each of us. So we all have a technician inside of us that knows how to do it. The doing it, doing it, doing it. Whether it's I Photoshop and I'm great at Photoshopping, editing, whatever it is that I do, that's the technician part of me. We also have a manager that knows how to design or plan or schedule or sometimes delegate to other people and making sure the task gets handled. And then lastly, there's the entrepreneur in us. There's the dreamer, the one who has the vision of where I want to go. And they're all three very different principles, three very different approaches. And what I want to build a case for here is that how you approach your business from any of these perspectives makes all the difference. If I approach my business as a technician, then all I'm looking at is day-to-day, -day, in the grind. I'm only going to get satisfaction from doing it, doing it, doing it. But do you think your business will ever move forward if you're always in it, if you're always in the business, doing it, doing it, doing it? What's your sense of that? Why not? I've seen a couple people shaking their head no. Why do you think? Yep, that's right. So there's actually no vision space of where you're going to lead people, right? And so if you're always, we call it heads down versus heads up leadership. If you're heads down leadership, you might be great at completing the tasks of the day, but you're still not moving the business forward. And if you have heads up leadership, you're able to see that horizon. So all the day-to-day -day operations that you're doing are connected to a bigger picture, and you never lose sight of that. So that's the difference between approaching it from an entrepreneurial perspective, your own business, or a technician perspective, and the manager. And, and how I see this is, my, my analogy, the technician is the ground troops. They're on the ground floor doing whatever your business needs that day, um, whether it's entering data or dealing with customers on the front lines. Um, it could be executing whatever your product or service is, or it could be a delivery. It could be whatever it is, producing film. And, and so they're about the ground floor up. The managerial level is more about 10,000 feet high in the air. So they're able to see a little more of what needs to happen. And they're, they're the mid-connection between the entrepreneur at the very top and the technicians who are doing the work. So these, these guys are really important. They're probably, in most businesses that I see, this is the biggest missing ingredient is good management or healthy management. This is usually the place where most issues show up is in leadership and management. And we'll talk about why later. So they're about 10,000 10, feet high in the air, uh, able to delegate to the troops below and make, make, make the design actually come forward, make it happen. And then the entrepreneur is about 30,000 feet high. They're about the airplane level, where they're able to see the whole horizon once again that we've been talking about. And they're able to delegate managers to make tasks happen. And, and, and so imagine if you have your CEO on the front lines answering phones, um, paying all the bills. Uh, doing all the sales themselves, doing everything in their business. This is pretty common. I see this every day um, with a lot of businesses that I work with. They're, they're still doing everything. And they haven't been able to get free of the business because they're in it. They can't work on it. They're, they're trapped inside of it all the time. So this goes into a little more detail here. So the technical work they, they do the, the direct hands-on work of creating, producing, selling, uh, delivering the products and services of the business. And as you see here in this photo, this, this uh, construction worker, he's, he's literally the one putting the, the nails in. And the manager builds a company culture of ownership where people own their results and process to realize the vision. So these guys make sure the dream comes true. That's their job. How do I make the vision of my business actually happen from, from my boss? Um, and it's actually their vision or the company's vision. How do I make it work? 
So they have to be good at executing strategies and they have to be behind it. If you have a manager who's not behind the vision, that's going to create a lot of problems down the road. And I've seen that too, where a lot of managers sabotage the company because they're actually not invested. They don't care. Or they're just not inspired by it. Or it's just not the right place for them to be. It just might not be the right company culture. Which is fine, but it's a problem if they're still in it. So the manager also monitors and drives the business development cycle. And we'll talk more about this later. Quantification, innovation, orchestration. That's how we develop systems in a business. So managers are really responsible most often for developing systems. What are the systems that my business needs? How do I design them? How do I plan for them? And how do I execute them? The stages of management. And then we have the entrepreneur. Continuously relates and communicates the vision. So it's not enough to just have a vision. I actually have to communicate it. Think about all great leaders that we've known in history. They knew, and what made them different, they knew how to communicate their vision. They knew how to enroll people because they were passionate about whatever they did. Whether we talk about Martin Luther King or um, Tom Watson of IBM, whatever sector of life, leaders not only are grounded in their own vision, but they actually know how to talk about it. They have it written down, they've thought about it, they've lived it, it's inside of them. And that's actually what inspires people, is we can feel their passion. We can feel that they're driven. There's a vision that, that they're on, on point. They have a true north. And then that's what enables people to follow that and get behind that. But a good entrepreneur, a good entrepreneur also knows how to enroll people around them in that vision and get them involved. So it's not just a separate thing that happens. So the entrepreneur watches and then leverages the conditions in the marketplace, looking for strategic partnerships, way to grow the business on the higher level. So once again, not just the day-to-day -day technical stuff, because that's not going to move your business forward in the bigger picture, um, but also being able to work on it on that higher level. So developing the strategies, the strategies that shape the growth and the expansion of the business. So there's really two, you can boil down all work in your business to two major categories. There's either strategic work or there's tactical work. And just think about this for yourselves right now, of what you do in your business. Just to start to get a brainstorming idea, what percent of my day am I actually doing strategic work where I'm defining results, I'm clarifying strategies, I'm designing new systems and programs. I have a new product I want to reimagine or a new service, or a new marketplace I want to explore. So I'm going to do some research and start to imagine what would happen if my business actually grew that arm and that expression, um, which doesn't exist right now, versus the tactical work. And the tactical work is all about actually producing the results. So one designs the results and sets the context, and the other one deals with the content of whatever the service is, or the product, or the task at hand. And it's not, and I want you to hear this too, it's not that the tactical work is bad and the strategic work is good. It's more that uh, not enough attention gets put on the strategic work. The tactical work is essential. If you didn't have people in your business or you sometimes doing the tactical work of your business, it wouldn't get done. The, the product wouldn't get delivered. The service wouldn't follow through. Um, the sale wouldn't get made. You know, whatever it is, whatever tactical work you're looking at, the data wouldn't get entered. Uh, whatever it might be, your business would not work with, without the help of the tactical side. So it's not that they're opposites, it's just how do I have them in the right uh, formula? How do I have them in the right relationship? I don't want my technician driving my car. But if I get a flat tire, I'm glad he's in the back seat because he knows how to fix that more than my manager and entrepreneur. right? My entrepreneur is just daydreaming in the car about where I want to go uh, in my life or whatever I'm thinking about. Uh, the manager is actually making sure I'm not speeding too far and the cop might be behind me and you know, that kind of thing. And the technician is, is ready for any kind of breakdown. So they're, they're essential, but you don't want them driving the vehicle of your business. And this is probably the greatest uh, e-myth, once again, that it's the entrepreneurial myth is it's really a technician in entrepreneurial clothes that's most often running your business and running your life. So here's an example. This is just an example of, uh, you could say, a common bell curve of what ideally it would look like. So if you're the CEO on top of the ladder, or if you're on the executive team here, 
ideally you'd be doing 75% entrepreneurial work. And when you get to the level of Richard Branson or some of these high level CEOs, that's what they do. They're always doing strategic partnerships and high level business development and they have their team where they're dreaming and they're reimagining different aspects of their business. So a really good CEO knows that they need to fire themselves from the low boxes on the organizational chart so they, they can be more free to do the high level work. And, and they're still going to be doing some managerial work. They're still, they still have to manage their executive staff and the senior level managers below them uh, to make sure they're carrying forward what they want. So they're still going to be doing, of course, some managerial work and, and probably some technical work. Most CEOs still love doing whatever they started in their business and they get joy from that. And that's the great part about being free in your business is that you can choose. You can say, you know what, I still want to go do sales once in a while because I love it. Or I want to get in front of clients because I want to remember, I don't want to ever lose that connection. Um, or you know what, if, I, this may sound crazy, but I love doing the books. Or I, every, maybe every once in a while I want to help out with um, some cash flow strategies uh, or what have you. So there's always going to be probably some technical work that, but, but they're doing it out of choice. They're doing it out of design, not out of default. That's the difference. Are you leading your business by design or by default? So once again, we get to senior managers, and it's a little bit of a different ratio. They're not doing as much entrepreneurial work because they're really serving the vision of the, uh, of the visionary. One second. And then they're going to be doing more of the managerial work in the middle here and directing a lot of uh, people and technicians and other managers below them, et cetera. And they're going to be doing more technical work. So you can start to see how the scales change as you go further down the organizational chart of a business. And then you have your managers doing mostly management. Maybe they do a little bit of entrepreneurial work of their department or their division or what have you. And they're doing more and more technical work. And then finally you get to the frontline employees who are almost all doing technical work, answering the phones, customer service, um, sales consultants, marketing associates, whatever it might be. Even if I'm a one person solopreneur, this is what I'm saying, if I'm a, even if I'm a solopreneur, and I've seen this all the time, how can I still divide up my time where I have some of my time where I know I'm wearing the entrepreneurial hat on purpose? And I'm going to set up one hour a day, we call it the critical hour a day, where I'm actually maybe visioning for the next year. What do I want my business to look and feel like this next year? And so what I'm saying is it's when we don't carve out these roles within ourselves, if we, when we don't allocate that time as we need, that's when we get into problems, right? And then we're just firefighting all the time and we never get to be the fire chief looking at the whole forest of what's going on. But you're kind of spoiling the next part here because we're going to get into how do you divide up your time? So what I want you guys to do is take out a pen if you brought a pen with you and I'm going to pass out some paper. And once again, lastly, this is once again the strategic side and of course the technical side. So we're going to do a quick time study. So I'm going to pass out some paper here. If you just pass this out to people behind you. I'll give you one. And I want you to draw three columns like it has here, three vertical columns, just like it does here. You can copy this page here. Okay, and here's what I'm going to have you do. So just like, what was your name in the back? Tanu. Kalu? T-A-N-U. Ta Tanu. Okay, thank you. So like what Tanu was saying, I'm going to have each of you start to think about, let's say you go to your job, uh, your business, whatever time in the morning you get there, I will actually want you to map out an average day, a normal day, a typical day of how you're spending your time. And what are the order of tasks that you actually do throughout the day? So take a moment to think about that. And here's an example. And I'm going to walk you through this. So let's say the, act, the first activity that I do every morning in my business is I check email for 45 minutes. Let's just say that's what it is. So the, the activity would be checking email. It could be making sales calls. It could be editing Photoshop. It could be whatever it is. And then, the, and then put the duration. And then I want you to start to think about is that an entrepreneurial hat that I'm wearing when I'm doing that? Is it a managerial hat? Am I designing a system or a new, a new uh, product or what have you? 
or a better way of answering phones? Um, or is it, am I doing technician work? So is it E, M, or T? And then overall, is that, do you think that's strategic or tactical? S or T for that? So I'm going to give you just three minutes, starting now, to map out an average day. So just take a moment to look at your sheet here and just take in and just start to notice, OK, what percentage of my time is tactical versus strategic? You know, the gentleman up here in the front says, I have a lot of T's on my paper. That's exactly the point, is to start to track, realistically, how am I actually spending my time? What perspective am I relating to my business through? What hat am I actually wearing? And once again, it's not that doing the tasks is necessarily bad. Maybe I want to do it because I love it. And the real question, once again, is am I choosing that? Is it by design that I have it that way? And is it best for my business that I'm still doing everything? So I have to ask that question if I'm the owner. Um, at the same time, am I just doing it because I, what if I feel like I'm the only one that can do it or no one can do it as good as me? And there could be other reasons why I'm doing the tasks. Maybe I'm afraid of delegating. Maybe I like to be in control. So there's a lot of angles to start to look at in yourself of, OK, am I doing this for, for healthy and good reasons and I'm choosing it? Or is it just by this habit or pattern that I'm still doing it all in my business? So it's a great question. And it's really great to really explore that in each of us. How many people here would you say um, you do about 30% strategic work throughout the day, on a typical day. Raise your hand if you're about 30%. More than that. More than that. How much about for you? 50. 50 for you. OK, that's, that's rare. Yeah. That's great. Um, anyone else? About 50% also. OK, great. What's that? Oh, because you're just starting out. See, that's a good point. That's a great point that when you're a startup, um, you have to do that, right? You have to have some plan. You have to have a business plan. You have to have a way to start building all the systems that aren't built yet. So that's a good point. Sometimes in the life cycle of a business, if it's a startup, um, that's going to be pretty expected. Uh, but this is good you're here now because you're going to have an eye on this a year from now that you don't slip into the 90% technician if you're the owner of your business, right? Um, so good point. How many people here, uh, maybe 20% strategic of their day? OK. How about 10%? OK. So the great majority of you are probably 90% tactical. So this sounds pretty appropriate here. I know some business owners, they'll spend literally, they'll block out half of a Monday just doing strategic work and kind of preparing themselves for the rest of the week. And that's the way they like to do it. So. Good question. It doesn't need to be regimented where, OK, I'm really going to do 20% every day. But sometimes that's a good discipline for people. The one thing to watch out for is, once again, if you're mostly your technician, he or she is not going to respect the high level stuff. And that's going to be put off to the side. It's going to be left at the end of the day, which then becomes tomorrow, which then becomes next month, which then becomes next quarter. So that's the thing to watch out for because once again, the technician gets value from getting things done, from doing things, from producing things. That's how our technicians get value. So can, that's the one thing I would watch out for is, is there an, a, uh, an area of importance where it starts to get uh, fluffed off to the end? Or can you actually have that discipline of, you know what, I'm intending to wear that hat today or that for this next couple hours. I'm going to put a sign on my office door. I'm going to turn off my email and my phone, and really dive in on this thing I need to work on. I need to work on my business. So I've, I've uh, launched three different businesses. And the first time I did it, I completely failed. I, had, I followed my passion. I did what I loved. But no one showed me how to do it. I didn't have any mentorship in, around me. So what I had to do is I had to kind of patchwork different people that I respected in my field and try to find uh, um, a better way to do it, or how, what is the way to do it? How do you do sales here? How do, how do you market yourself? And I didn't know that stuff. So I had to, so, but, I, but I wanted to find out. And so I got curious enough to say, you know, I care enough about my passion. It's, it's actually my responsibility to get it out in the world. Or I'm always going to maybe play victim in my business, or just give up, or just work for somebody else. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. So I had to find ways and be proactive and like I said, the first time it didn't work. But that didn't stop me. It had me actually want to learn more about business. I used to do this to business at one point, 
and now I'm a business coach. So for me, this is a great example of leaning into the thing that used to scare me or the thing that, I was, that wasn't familiar to me. Or I just didn't know about it, so I just kind of avoided it. And, and this is an interesting thing to think about in your business. What are the things that you avoid? Is it money? This is a big one for people. people a lot of people avoid finances. It's like, get that away from me and I just tell me how much I owe, right, for the, for the quarter. Um, sometimes it's sales. Are, that's also a really loaded um, part of the business. It's people just don't want to do sales. Sometimes it's, for me, sometimes I have to actually get myself over something to, to update my blog, you know, that kind of thing. So once again, notice what are the things I'm doing this to, and if I'm starting a business, shouldn't I be a little curious about how to make it work? And sometimes they can hire people also. I can hire a general manager, but if I'm not taking ownership of my business, and I'm, if I'm not open to that and, and learning and trying to see what I can do to help, help my business, it's my business at the end of the day. So what I would say is some people try to hire a general manager and then they think that their job is done. And that can be a, that's big, a big time trap because a lot of owners then are just really disconnected from their own business. So just, just as a food for thought, just notice where am I already disconnected from, from my business and what can I do about that? Is that okay with me? That I have no idea about sales, but I need to sell my products and services somehow. I need to fund the business. Or I have no idea how to uh, network and meet people and those kinds of things. Is that okay for me or am, am I tired of that? Am I ready to do something different even if it goes against my comfort zone? So once again, to come back to this, this, so just looking at your sheet once again, how close are you to which one of these areas, uh, these levels of relating to your business? I think most of you were saying more, more around the front line. But not all of you. Some of you have closer to 50%. So somewhere in between, or somewhere more up here. Okay. This is one of my favorite quotes. How you think about business is how you end up doing the business. So once again, am I thinking about it like a technician, a manager, or an entrepreneur? And when am I wearing what hat? So this is what I also want you to write on your paper. Think about this. For, this is for you. This is for your business. What do I need to continue doing? Looking at my tactical list on my paper right now, my tasks. What do I actually need to continue doing out of those different things? What do I actually need to stop doing? So notice if there's some items on your list right now that are actually not helping you move your business forward. It's like, you know what, I don't really need to be answering all my customer phones. Or I don't need to be um, dealing with the bookkeeping. Ideally, someone else should be doing that in my business, for example. And then lastly, what do I need to start doing? What's really obvious when I'm looking at my paper right now, oh my god, I need, I need to put more attention here. This would give me more bang for my buck of my business leadership if I put more of my attention on this part of my business. Um, okay. This is one of the interesting concepts in EMIT that I'm really passionate about. And this is a question to ask yourself and, and to remember that your business is, is inside of you. That you're actually bigger than your business. But how often does it actually feel like that? Where are those moments where you feel like your business is bigger than you? You're inside of your business. And you're a victim to how things are going even though you've made the choices to put yourself in that place, right? So to look at what does that mean to get the business inside of me? What does it mean to take more ownership of my business wherever I might not be? So that's what we're going to be looking at is that, that, that whole relationship once again of what does it mean to be bigger than my business? And, there, and if I'm overwhelmed, if I feel overwhelmed, in those moments the business is bigger than me. When I'm actually bigger than my business, I don't feel overwhelmed. And I, I experience both. Sometimes I experience my business is bigger than me and I'm a subject to the business and I gotta do these things and that happens of course for all of us. But this is a helpful reminder of how do I shift that relationship? What do I need to do today or tomorrow to start getting a little bit bigger? And, and these are the seven dynamics of EMIF. Uh, once again, this is kind of neat. We've mapped out the seven major areas of a business to pay attention to. We call it the seven dynamics. They've evolved over the last 36 years. Emeth has been doing this for about 36 years. And all of these are systems. You know, we have, our, we have leadership systems. 
financial systems, you know, your cash flow, um, your, your profit and loss, these kinds of things. Management systems, you know, your operational systems, your organizational strategy is a system. And just think about which ones of these do we have? Which, are one, which ones are we not so strong in in our business? Our delivery systems, are, do we have it mapped out from, from uh, developing your product to actually delivery? Is it all mapped out? Have you systemized excellence in your business? Do you do it at the same time every time? And that's having a really good delivery systems. Were there actually, do you actually have them written out? And so that, once again, you can scale the business beyond you. Because if you're trapped as a technician inside of your business, you can never scale it, and you can never sell your business also if you wanted to. Because people will see that if you leave, the business leaves. And plus, you never get to have vacations. So this is really in your best interest to start, how do I start systemizing my business? Do I have sales systems? Do I actually have a strategy? Or do I just kind of wing it? Do I rely on a big personality when I'm making a sale? Or is there actually, have I actually mapped out the emotional benchmarks that happen in a sales process? And then I'm, le I'm staying related with my, my prospect throughout the whole sales conversation, or not. Marketing systems, do I even have a social media strategy? Do I have a marketing plan? Do I know, do I know who my ideal customer is? You know, do I have those systems in place? Am I tracking, if I just did a, a marketing campaign, if it actually got results? And how, how much were the results? Was it worth uh, putting my marketing budget on the line for that campaign or not? So do I have my marketing systems? And my, of course, branding systems. Um, do I, is my whole business a, the product? Is my look and feel consistent? Is what I want my customer to experience consistent in every part of my business? Do I have those branding systems in place? So this is just a good for you to start making a note. Where are we already strong? Maybe we're doing that really well. And then where's the place where, wow, we haven't put any attention on that, or I haven't put any attention on that. And so that's a good thing to note. And then how could, how could I then be proactive and get help? Get some mentorship or coaching, whatever it might be, consulting, you know, whatever, whatever it is. I should want, if that's my business, I should want to get support around that. So I'll just leave it at that. And we're focusing mostly today on, we call these the internal disciplines of a business, the top three. And the bottom three are the external activities of your business. These are more outward facing to your clients. These are more in, internal to the business. Having a good infrastructure, your management, your finances, and your branding, and your leadership. And the test is always, if I were to get 30% more sales next week, do I actually have the infrastructure to handle that? Or would I just be completely overwhelmed and dropping balls in my business? So that's always a good uh, litmus test. When you're, when you're looking at this. That's a good indicator. Are there cracks in the dam if there's a lot of water? Okay, we're just going to touch on this briefly. We're not going to go too deep into this one. Just like we talked about the three uh, personalities, the three perspectives, there's also the four roles. And these are roles that are being embodied in your business whether you're aware of it or not, or should be embodied in your business, even if you're one person. Sometimes you're going to be acting as the chief executive officer, you know, holding the vision and leading the business forward and getting people inspired around you, um, having those, those phone calls and those strategic partnerships, et cetera. The chief financial officer, you're you know, really holding the finances and making sure you know what the numbers are telling you about your business and that you're taking responsibility for that. You're, or you're having a, you have a really good accounting team and, and you feel empowered to ask the questions that you need to ask. So once again, it doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself, but you're getting the help you need if you don't have that. Your chief branding officer, this is the person or the part of you that is responsible for the voice of the company, the look and feel. You know, if you look at Apple, they're so great at their brand. Um, they put so much attention on design and beauty and intuition and user friendliness, all those things. It's sleek. Those are the first things you think about with Apple. Uh, when you think about Dell PC, those things don't come to mind, right? So you can see where a business right away is, is connected. They have someone holding the brand. And most businesses these days, the bigger ones, they actually have a brand officer. They have someone responsible to make sure that look and feel is consistent. And businesses are getting more than, now more than ever how important that is in a business. So even if you're one person, are you still putting some attention on, what is my customer experience? 
every time they interact with me on some level. Or they see my website. They see my business card. Is it a consistent feel or is it pretty disjointed? So this is where this would come in handy. And then lastly, my chief operations officer. Uh, I love these drawings here. Um, this is the guy who's really making sure I have the right people in the right places. Or once again, if it's just me, I'm balancing out my day the right way. You know, maybe I am putting 30% of my strategic work on Fridays, and that's what I need. Or I'm, I know how to organize my people. If I have staff, and how many people here do have employees? I'm curious. So three? So not so many. Uh, but if you have staff, you know, do I have them in the right places? Maybe I don't. What's the best architecture to grow my business? And even if I'm a solopreneur, and I, ha I still have to work with contractors, I need to contract out help, um, am I managing them the right way? And this is where you want to make sure your organizational strategy, you have that clear to some degree, or you're working on it. OK. We're just going to kind of go through these briefly. These are the last principles we're going to go into. And then we're going to talk about how to actually make your business profitable. thought you'd probably be interested in that today. OK. So these are the nine principles of E-Myth. And once again, these are the foundational aspects of leading a business. And we're going to go through all these right now. I'll let you take your screenshots here. OK. So here's the first one. And we talked about this already. Your business is inside of you. How often do we forget this graphic right here, that life is actually bigger than our work? Our work should be serving our life, not the other way around. That life is serving my, my work. Life is always bigger. Even if you worked 24-7, um, your life is still bigger. Uh, you can't work 24-7, but even if you did for a day or two, eventually, life is just a higher order of reality. You can't, but how often do we forget that? How often do we flip that around, right? Where work feels bigger than our life. And we lose that sense of what we're doing it for. We lose our, we lose our connection with why. You know, why did I start this business in the first place? Why am I five years into it and it is, it's in the shape that it is? A lot of times we lose, even if we're a startup, this is good to hear, if we're a startup, it can be very exciting in the beginning and we have a lot of that passion and the why and we're more connected to that. But then after three, four years, 10, 11 years, a lot of times we have to continue reimagining our business because we forget. We forget why we started it in the first place. Or maybe the market has changed and what we thought was the place the market was going is now in a different direction, right? So this happens a lot. So once again, how do you keep getting that your business is inside of you and where are the places to work on that when it's not, when it feels upside down? This is another great one here. Change is inside out, not outside in. Most people think if they need to change something, they just change the symptoms, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, that if I just throw money at it, oh, my, my business will change, everything will be fine. If I just incentivize my staff, if I give them a bonus, they'll be inspired and motivated. And this is interesting, what research shows, if you actually um, incentivize people, it has short-term benefit, but it has no long-term traction. That over time, people are either motivated or they're not. They're either connected to what you're doing, because you've done a good job of your brand and, and sharing your passion and your why, or you haven't. So that's where change from the outside in actually is very temporary and it doesn't actually stick. Real change is, once again, being able to accept my situation first. Like when you said, it scares me to, to imagine strategic work or gosh, that's the first step to change. Because you start to feel that and you can accept that about, about yourself or your situation and then you can do something about it, right? Versus just throw more money at a problem and hope it goes away magically. Okay. This is another great one. Realness is required when you're leading your business. And in today's era, this is true more than ever now. Think about this. With social media, with what people are saying about you on the web, um, you have no choice but to get real. Because people are going, if, if you're trying to sell something on the web but it's actually not how people experience you, that's going to be uh, pretty obvious soon, right? I don't know, your Yelp review or whatever it might be. Transparency is more valued in today's marketplace than it's ever been. 
w and this is true with employees, employee relationships. This is true with yourself, you, between you and you. It's also true with your customers, your vendors, your suppliers. That if you're trying to put on some kind of show, but it's not, you can't back it up. You don't deliver on your promise. That's going to come back to bite you. So really, how can I get more real with my situation? Once again, maybe I'm uncomfortable with finances, and how can I get a little more real to myself about that? Like, wow, okay, this is overwhelming. I want to sit down with my accountant next week and really just start to get a little more sense of what, what it's telling me about my business. Am I profitable? Do I have a healthy cash flow? Those kinds of things. If I'm in my sales, if I'm a salesperson or if I have the sales hat on, am I being real with my, with my prospects? Am I trying to kind of snowball them into something? Or am I, actually, am I actually legitimately saying, hey, you know, we actually don't do that, but I'd recommend this guy over here. Or, yeah, we, I can take care of that for you. And I really can. So something to really think about. This will, put you, this will give you a competitive advantage in today's market because traditionally realness hasn't been required in the past. This is an interesting distinction here. Ownership does not equal equity. A lot of people think of ownership as salaries, um, stock options, you know, equity in the business. I, I have ownership in my business. And what we're saying is actually ownership is so much bigger than that. Ownership is how I show up as, my, as, the business, as the leader of the business every day, how I show up. That's what ownership really is. And if I show up and I'm not, once again, I'm disconnected from my business or whatever might be happening, then people are going to feel that. My employees will feel that. My customers will feel that. If I don't really show up, if I don't really care about what I'm doing, or if I'm kind of half in, half out, people feel that now more than ever. That's that realness part also. So how to get real with, what's my level of ownership? And sometimes ownership starts with, what haven't I been owning? I've seen that happen, and, and I used to work for this great company where the CEO was amazing, and he led with by example, and he would say, hey, I haven't been doing a good enough job the last couple months, and I'm not qualified to be the CEO a year from today unless I step it up. And that's true for everyone in this room, is what he said. And I remember being in the room, my jaw dropped like, wow, did I just hear a CEO actually say that? That's pretty rare. So he was actually leading with what he hadn't been owning, and he, he got into his own specific content. But to me, my respect for him increased like 50% or through the roof. So just something to start to look at is, what if the carrots don't incentivize people? It's really about a culture of ownership in your business or when you're working with contractors, whatever it might be. How do you, when you can model that, that sense of ownership in yourself, that's going to be contagious to those around you. This is an interesting one. Meaning is not in your head. We don't find actual meaning in the checks and balances, the, the uh, digital ones and zeros. Um, if I say, you know, I, I want to get a million dollars and then I'll be happy, then I'll find meaning. It actually usually doesn't end up working that way. And, and the reason is, meaning actually drives, meaning is the motivator. We live in more and more in what we're calling a meaning-based economy. Or, a, or as Seth Godin says, a connection economy. That when we are inspired with what we do, and we learn then how to make money doing that, then we're, we're in our passion and we're really on our, on our path that way. And, and it's actually, that's the, the kind of the secret ingredient is, when I lead with meaning, money actually follows. But when I go for the money as my, as my aim, then a lot of times I, I st I'm actually disconnected from, from the day in and day out of my business. So, and marketers have known this for a long time. Marketers know that we choose things emotionally first. Emotively, we make business decisions. Uh, we hire people. They say within the first seven seconds, usually you know if you want to hire that person or not. Now it's good to do your due diligence and follow through on your references and all that, but that's how quick our emotive connections are. That, that we're leading actually more from a heart or emotive place more than we give ourselves credit for. And more and more um, psychology and the business world and marketing are starting to catch on to this more and more. And you'll continue to see more and more articles along these lines. This is a, an interesting one, Got Meta. 
And this is a, back to your point, sir, what we were talking about earlier, that am I just addressing the symptoms of my business, that leaves are falling on the plant of my business, or am I paying attention to the soil, the sun, the water level, you know, the, the underlying conditions of my business? And so the more I'm actually addressing the real issue, then the symptom will take care of itself. Um, I think Einstein said, the problem can't be solved on the same level of consciousness that created the problem. So that's what getting meta, get, got meta means is, can I get a higher level perspective of what's going on in the business? Can I take that moment and say, okay, we're having this problem again and again and again. Or I have this one customer issue that keeps showing up in my business. Why is that? Am I even asking why? That's how you, that's how you get meta, is you ask why. Two, two and three-year-olds are great at this, but we kind of forget over time to ask why. You know, why is it that my customers keep complaining about the same thing? You know, why is it that my, I'm, I'm okay with my vendors sh bringing their materials late every time, and I don't say anything about it? What's the real issue? And, and the more you can go meta and start getting the bigger perspective, the bigger holistic piece that's missing, that's how you get at the root issue. And we talked about this earlier too. This is just a fact. Discomfort is part of the job. If you're always comfortable in your business, you're probably not challenging yourself. If everything is always smooth, or even if it's chaotic and you're okay with that and you're comfortable with that, you've gone to sleep in your business. So how can you just accept, okay, discomfort is gonna be, if I'm leading, I'm, that means I'm going into new territory. By definition, I'm leading in a new way. I'm going to be facing things I didn't face a year ago in my business. That's how you know your business is really growing. There's always going to be challenges and problems you didn't have to deal with a year ago. So it never really ends. So what happens if I actually just accept that? This is one of those key ways of getting bigger than your business uh, frustrations. Is okay, you know what? Sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes, you know, sales is maybe, maybe sales will never be comfortable for me. And can I still go out there and just know that and give it my best? So think about the different ways that this might stop you from the biggest growth potential in your business today. What's that one thing that's the most uncomfortable? I would I even have you write it down, just for you. Not for me, but for you. What's the most uncomfortable part of your job? What's the most uncomfortable part of your business that you avoid more than anything? And there's probably that's probably the, the secret door to your business success, whatever that is. So just make a note I would offer. We could, we could talk about later what to do with that. Okay, this is uh, just two more here. So creating value, not work. This is a great one. So if I'm a manager or even for myself, it's not about just creating more and more work for people to be busy and then I feel productive, but it's actually how do I create value? If I'm a manager, how do I actually train the people below me so that they can step up and they can actually learn to manage? So I'm creating value, I'm actually forwarding their career. Um, or if I'm working with a contractor and I want them to uh, take another level of ownership uh, or help them out that way, but it's also helping my business too. Um, and, and for myself, what are ways that I'm not just doing the, biz, the busy work because it's easy or because I know how to do it, what's actually the work that is gonna bring value to my business? And lastly, systems are a means. And this is how we think about systems at EMIF, is there's, there's three stages to building any system in your business. First, you need to innovate the system. You know, what, what's the system that I'm missing? Oh, I don't have a, um, I don't have a sales system. I don't, have, uh, I don't have stages of how I walk people through a sale. And then you have to quantify this. Okay, now, that, now that you've created the system, you've innovated it, then you quantify, is it working? Is, when I do that one consultation, let's say I'm a, let's say I'm a photographer and I, I lead people through a consultation. Do they want the wedding package? Do they want um, a, you know a portrait package? You know what does that look like? And then how do I do my consultation? How do I tweak that? And what's the most effective? And so then I want to quantify. Does that work? And then once I understand more and more what's working and what's not working. Then I can orchestrate that pattern. I can I can carry it forward. 
This could be true with any system in your business. You know, if I have a website, if I develop a website, and there's certain you know systems with that, what's where do people actually click on my website? I, I, there's now technology where you can actually find where people hover their mouse exactly on your website. You probably some of you probably know this, and where they don't. And so now a lot of businesses are using that data. They're quantifying that, and then they're orchestrating a new pattern. Oh, we need a video up in the first third of the web page. Oh, people don't. Uh, People, people don't, don't sign up for newsletters anymore or, or whatever it might be. They're, they're changing around the content just to find out what's the best system for our website as one example. All right, so now we're going to take a, little, a, a more uh, financial look and, about what actually makes your business profitable. How do you actually translate, once again, as artists, your passion is there. That's obvious. You love doing what you do, but how do you actually then translate that in a profitable, real, tangible way. You guys interested in that? Yeah, a few, okay. So once again, with business coaching at eMyth, we've seen this for over 36 years now. Here's the top three symptoms that we see with most business owners. And this is across every industry. We've worked with business owners in over 145 countries around the world. Here's the first one. Tell me if you can relate to these. My business leaves me feeling less happy and less in control of my life. Anyone relate to that one? No? No one? My hard work doesn't lead to increased profits. So I might working, be working my butt off, but I'm actually not that profitable. And I don't know why that is. is it, anyone relate to that one? A couple, few people? Yeah? And this one, the bez, business never grows as fast as it could. Like it should be a little faster. I've been putting so much of my sweat in this every day. I know it's just not getting traction. Why is that? I'm frustrated. So some people can relate to that one? Yeah, that one's common. So what to do about these? And, and, and then if, if yours isn't caught up here, think about that. What's, what's my version of the wall? What's my version of hitting the wall? Just think about that. OK. Now we're going to jump into profitability here. So here's what we're going to discuss. And it's not just high level. I want to give you some real action steps of what to do, what to take. So how to get more control and happiness in your business. How to actually do that. We'll talk about that in a second here. How to actually hit your profit targets. Like what, out of all the things in my business, what do I need to put attention on that I know will help my profits? We've done research on this. I'm going to share that with you. And how do I achieve real and sustained growth? So not just short-term uh, wins, but actually something that's sustainable and reoccurring every month. So we did a research project. Um, Emith did this with a, a company called Pixel Spoke. Um, and it's called State of the Business Owner. And so over 1,700 business owners um, responded to the survey over, in over 80 different countries around the world. Average revenue of each business was about 4.7 million. This was uh, in Forbes magazine and Portland Business Journal, etc. And we asked them a series of questions about what is the state of their business? You know, what are the things you struggle with? What are the things that are you more optimistic in 2012 than you were in 2011, uh, or or not? You know, where's the trends of today's pulse of the small business world? And so that's exactly what we set out to explore. So here's the results that we found. So one of the big things is that most businesses, and I've seen this with, with all the companies I work with too, and the solopreneurs, that cash flow is usually one of the biggest issues. This is interesting. My business can be profitable, but I still could be cash poor. I still might not have cash in the bank. And if I, if I, don't, if I don't have cash in my business, nothing cripples a business faster. Because it's truly the lifeblood of a business. You need to have money. If there's emergencies, if you need to put a little more finances in marketing, uh, bring on another employee, whatever it might be, this is one of the biggest challenges for most business owners. 63% think the economy will get better. And so we're seeing this after the recession in 2008. Uh, we're seeing that every year people are starting to get now more optimistic about the marketplace. Um, and so this was the 2013 report on the whole year of 2012. And so we'll do that again this year as well. 25% owners are more optimistic about their revenue growth than they, than they were the year before. 
So this is encouraging signs for the marketplace and what's out there. We're kind of crawling out of that recession, like I said. People are loosening up their, their belts a little bit and spending a little bit more than they used to. Um, also, slow staff growth. So 40% more revenue growth than staff growth. So they're still kind of getting tight with bringing on more people. And so that can create some bottlenecks in your business. Uh, so it's an interesting dynamic where even though the people are getting more money, it's almost like I think they're still a little bit tense and afraid that the economy could crash again. They don't want to take that risk of bringing on somebody new. This is interesting. Low employee raises, 50% um, of businesses uh, gave raises of 2% or less in 2012. So pretty low raises uh, for this last year. And profits, uh, businesses that we um, surveyed, 60% of them were actually more profitable. And I think why that's so high is a lot of them have been exposed or been coached or something to do, something to do with EMIT where they've been working on their profitability. So that's probably a little bit skewed than average population. A couple other interesting results. Only 30% of businesses said that their marketing effectively supported their sales efforts. That's interesting. That's not much. So a third of businesses are saying that there's a disconnect between their marketing and their sales. And they don't really know how their marketing translates to sales. So once again, if I'm generating a lot of leads, am I actually quantifying and tracking where they come from and, and the, um, the actual potential, the actual conversion rates? Is that something that I track in my business? I'm curious, how many of you actually track those kinds of metrics? So one, okay, interesting. Yeah, maybe, maybe two. This is key because we spend so much attention and money and resources on marketing that it's a shame when, when there's that much of a disconnect between well, what's the actual results? Is it profitable? Am I getting revenues? Am I getting results? Um, how would I even find that out? Sometimes people don't know where to start. 61% of, of businesses said that they do not know how to effectively use online marketing techniques. And, and I, I get this. I mean, there's so much stuff out there every day. There's the latest website, the latest um, strategy. I'll just throw money at SEO optimization. I'll throw money at Google AdWords, and maybe that will change my business, right? So a lot of people don't actually know how to effectively use these techniques. And one of the biggest reasons why that I see, people don't actually have a marketing strategy that supports all their activities. So they just kind of, uh, you ever seen that, the game at the carnival, like whack-a-mole, where a new mole comes up and you have to whack it and you don't know when the next one's gonna come up? You guys ever seen that? A lot of people relate to their marketing that way. That, okay, well let's just try Google AdWords. Okay, I'll try a blogging. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, I'm gonna try, and so they keep uh, moving forward in these disjointed activities or they listen to the latest buzz on their favorite websites that talk about this, like TechCrunch or whatever it might be, but what happens is uh, there's no, once again, underlying principle of what is my marketing plan? Do I even know who my ideal customer is first? Am I clear about my brand? Do I know how to have that conversation? Um, and really speak, and know, know, get, the per get my customer's world and know how to speak to them in that way. And then, and then who, who's my customer and who's not my customer? And the more that I'm clear about that, I'm gonna be having a strategy that actually supports which techniques make sense for my business. You know, maybe for me, Facebook doesn't make sense, but LinkedIn does. Uh, so it's good to start thinking about not just doing what everybody else does, but how would I start to learn what, how do I test the market and, and know what my co competitors are doing? That's a great way is to look at your competitors' websites, especially the ones that are successful, and start to make note, okay, they have a pretty big uh, Tumblr presence, a pretty big Instagram presence, they're not doing anything on this one over here. Interesting. And just to start to take note of that. And see what fits for your business. Okay, number of businesses with results oriented role descriptions increased by 33%. So what we find is a lot of people who are running the business actually don't have role descriptions for their employees or what we call position agreements. Where you're actually managing the expectations of that person in the business. And, and we'll, see, we'll see later, when you do have role descriptions, it increases your profitability um, by several percentages. 
Also, financial transparency. This is always a really tricky one with business owners is wanting to share their financials, and I get why. And we find that 40% of businesses share no financial data with their employees at all. 40%. And what, here's the interesting. What we found is that the fastest growing companies were sharing top level financial data with their employees. And what I mean by top level is more the general broad brush strokes of your business. It might be your top sales target goals, your revenues, where you're at in that bigger picture. It's not all the details of the business. You're not sharing your profit and loss statement with every employee. So I'm not saying that. Um, and also, a lot of it is not their business, right? That's not, that's not what they're holding in the business. That's not what they're responsible for. So you don't want to share all of your financial data, but how do you at least give them the temperature? How do you start to share just where you're at? So they, Because they're going to feel it anyway. They're going to feel your anxiety, or if things are really great, you want to be able to share your wins and share your successes also. So how do you involve your people? Um, and it, yeah, so, so something to consider is, how do I relate to my finances and, and what would make sense in my business to share with whom to help enroll them and involve them on what's really going on and how I can get them to help contribute? Thirty percent of businesses take 15 days or longer to get financial data at the end of the month. And frankly, that's too long. And the reason why is when you get that financial reports a couple days after the month or a day after the month, then you can really see exactly how your business has been performing and make different decisions, make different managerial choices based on that. But if you're not tracking this stuff until, and this is average, sometimes it's, you know, I get it a, a two months later or three months later, I start to look at that stuff. So you're not using the tools available is what this is saying. Okay, this is interesting here. The growth paradox. So one of the biggest things, the, the biggest thing that people say they want in 2013, the number one word that sh kept showing up was growth. This was almost universal. That everyone just agrees that they want growth, but they also realize that's what frustrates them the most, is they just don't know how to do it, or they get stuck somewhere. There's something that's not following through. So we decided to take a deeper look at that. You know, what actually is getting in the way of growth? And, this, and what we found is surprising. And this is one other piece that goes along with that, is why did you start your business? <laughs> and we'll, this is interesting. What we found is the number one answer of why people started their business was they want more freedom. They wanted to feel a sense of freedom in their life. The second reason was passion. They felt passionate about something. They loved their craft, whatever it was, and they wanted to bring more of that into the world. The third one was independence. They had a sense of being independent if they got to start their own business, and that was attractive to, to that business owner. The fourth one was money. So I thought that was the surprising, that out of everyone research, that everyone surveyed, that the reason why they started their business, the fourth one down was actually finances and money. That, and this is showing us, once again, that more and more we're moving towards this meaning-based economy where we want to feel connected to what we do. And if you think about it, if you're working 40, 50 hours a week, sometimes 60, 70, this is your life, you know, a good chunk of your life, that you should want to feel passionate or connected to what you're doing, or that's going to be um, impacting other parts of your life too, if you're miserable. So interesting that this is why, deep down, the deeper reason why entrepreneurs are more and more starting businesses today. Okay, this is fascinating here. So most people think, here's the paradox to grow. Most people think, if I have more money, then I'll have more control, and then I'll actually feel free, right? And it seems logical, right? You know, if I had more revenues, if I had more money coming in, then I could put that over here, I could do this, I could hire someone else, I could um, have five more salespeople delivering my services out there and selling my services. If I just had more money, that's my problem. I don't have enough sales. I don't have enough finances. This is the, probably the number one complaint I hear. I don't have enough sales. Here's actually what we found in our survey. It's actually the opposite. That when I actually get control of my business first, then I get more revenue. That actually generates more revenue. And we found this with research, hard numbers. And then, then once I have that, then I can exhale a little bit more and feel a little more free. So it's actually the reverse that I first need to get control of my business. I need to get bigger than my business frustrations and get to the bottom of the real issues. 
um, and if I'm ever going to actually generate money. And one way to think about this is if I'm operating my business from overwhelm, how am I going to have space to do anything else? We all know this. Like when I'm panicked or anxious or overwhelmed, I'm not thinking and feeling from the best me, right? I'm not operating from the best part of me. And I'm probably going to make decisions out of panic, out of scarcity, and not make the best business decisions, right? So that's the whole point is instead of operating from that place of panic and I'll just throw money at it, like someone said earlier, how can I start to get control of my business first? What do I need to do today to get to feel a little more in control? What do I need to put attention on today? Okay, now we're going to talk about the ownership stack and, and what we have found are the best ways to grow profits in your business and what you should be paying attention to that will make a difference. So I'm going to actually pass this out. It's called the ownership scorecard. And as we're going through, I want you to make a note. Are you actually doing these things today or not? So just check it off if you're doing it or you're not. Um, and it, this will give you more information. So you want to get out a pen again and as we go through these. So once again, we wanted to take a deeper look at growth and actually look at what actually translates to real growth. And out of all the parts of a business, what should you be putting attention on that makes the, what's the difference that makes the difference? Here's what we found. These are the, we call it the ownership stack, that if you're owning these nine parts of your business, your growth, your profits are going to be increasing by 60% than, than if you had not done these activities. 60%. That's pretty big. So let's take a look at each of these and what we mean. And, th and then once, a once again, go through the scorecard here and just check off which, one, which of these do you have, which of these systems do you have, which of these do you not have as we go through. So the first one, for example, written values. How many of you actually, when you started your company or your business, actually have a written set of values? How many have taken the time to say, you know, what are we really standing for? What actually makes us different than our, our competitors over here? You know, what is really the fabric of our company culture? Even if I'm one person, why, would, why should someone buy from me? Why should they care? What is it about, and then what's going to be my true north or my guiding principle in how I do business? And how do I stay consistent with that no matter what? So just to start thinking about that, how many of you have a, a value system that you've written on paper, you have your company values, that kind of thing. You've actually done that work. A question? Yep. No. Oh, OK. Um, so that would be the first place. And a little secret, your written values are actually the essence of your brand. And, and the mission, that's right. The mission, the vision. This is where it all starts, is, is the why. You know, Simon, one of my favorite quotes, Simon Sinek says, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, because there's about 100 other people that do the same thing, sometimes. They buy why you do it. When people feel your, your values, your passion, your purpose, those kinds of things, that's what personally connects with your target audience. That's what moves people. That's what brings brand loyalty over time. Quick story, you know, um, Apple wasn't the first company that invented the MP3 player, the iPod. It was a different company. But they didn't know how to, they had no values or vision or connection in how to get their message across. So they would say, hey, we have a 10 gigabyte MP3 player. Do you want one? And at the time, no one knew what that was. So it didn't sell. And then Apple took a look at that and said, hey, there's something here. And in typical Apple fashion, they said, hey, we can put uh, 20,000 songs in your pocket. Do you want one? And right away, the iPod was born. So there, and, and, and what I respect about Apple, and you can see this has changed since Steve Jobs has passed away. What I respect about them is they were really connected to their values. And Steve was a shark about that. He would never allow his company to go two degrees off of what he said Apple stands for. And how we're not IBM, we're not Microsoft. Um, we are Apple, and here's, here's what we believe in. Here's how we challenge the status quo. We're not the blue suit, red tie, my, uh, IBM people. You know, We think differently. We're creative, intuitive, et cetera. 
So they had clear values that guided them the whole way with every choice they made in the business. And they had a very clear vision also, which is the next one, is do you actually have a written vision for your business? It's another system to check off or not. Do you have a written system? I'm sorry, a written vision of what you want your business to look like two to three years from now when it's completed. Two to three years from now, how do you want your business to look like, feel like, act like, and perform like? And do you have a very clear picture? Otherwise, you're flying the airplane, I would offer, without any kind of uh, gauge, any kind of navigation device. You're just flying the airplane thinking that, OK, well, I'm high enough off the ground. I hope I have enough fuel. I'm going, I think I'm going in the right direction. I'm not actually sure. That's what happens when you're running a business without a vision. And also how to update the vision, because maybe a year from now, you have a lot of new information. So how do you keep it a living document, not just a thing that you frame on the wall, but it's a living document that actually is a tool, a leadership tool, and a leadership system for your business. Business metrics, are, you, are there key metrics, are there key indicators that you know are important to your business's growth? Whatever your vision is, if it's, I want to see five locations in three years, I want to see 20 employees, I want to see this much in revenue, what are the key indicators and are you actually quantifying? Are you actually, met, like, how many leads did I get this month? And what are my tar what's my target? How many sales did I actually make this month? And what's my target? If I'm not creating metrics, then I'm never going to know if I'm achieving my vision or actually moving in a different direction. So this is one of the huge systems to put in a business for profitability, is the owners who are actually tracking and writing down metrics. You know, in your business, do you have a written marketing plan? Do you actually have a, once again, a strategy? Do you know who your target market is? Do you know their demographics? Do you know how they think and feel and make purchase decisions? Um, do you know your sub-markets? Maybe you have a primary market that's pretty obvious, but maybe you have other flanker markets that are also important that you're maybe you're not putting enough attention on. And, and I, I, always, I always love that idea too, like who's not my market? I don't want to waste my time, energy, and money in the resources where it's not going to pay off, right? But do I have a plan? Do I have a strategy? Uh, the next one is, do I have an ideal customer profile? Have I really nailed down exactly who I want my customer to be or who they are? And have I tested that out? And this is pretty key also. A lot of times at Emith, we start with the end result first and then work backwards. So if I, if I know what I want my business to look like three years from now in the vision, then I can actually start to move that in that direction. If I know who my ideal customer is, I can start to strategize how do I get in front of that person? How do I go to those networking events? How do I talk to my friends who know those people? How do I market on my blog or my website to those industries? Those, those kinds of things. And I won't know if I haven't done this work and I haven't created that system. So it's, it's actually one of the most important, it's one of the top nine to grow your business. And, and the real good businesses know exactly who their customer is. And that's where marketing becomes, and sales becomes a lot easier. And then with that, marketing metrics. Once again, we talked a little bit about this, but am I actually tracking how many leads I got from that campaign that I did? And are my newsletters even useful? Um, are people paying attention to my blog? Or should I try this other social media? channel because the other ones aren't working? Am I tracking the metrics? That's, so that's something you should be thinking about in your business. Do you do that or not? Role descriptions. This is more in, in internal. So if you have employees, do you have role descriptions for your people so they know exactly what they're supposed to do every day? Do you also have one for yourself? Even if you're a solopreneur, have you carved out a context for you? Like, you know what? This is what I should, I should be doing every day. So I don't forget. I'm actually defining my position, even if I'm the CEO and the only person in my business. Is it so it's very powerful when people actually make clear what they're supposed to be doing every day, what's the result they should be achieving every day? What are and what are the standards? How should I be achieving that result? What are my tasks I should be paying attention to? And this will help when you're doing the things you shouldn't be doing also. Uh, one of the last ones, revenue plan. Do I actually have a revenue plan for the future? Do I have a budget? Do I know how much I want my business needs to make to meet my operating expenses? 
Um, do I have a cash forecast? Am I predicting the next three to six months how much cash I think my business will have on hand? You know, what is my plan revenue-wise? Because that's, of course, the lifeblood of the business. Uh, and then lastly, repeat sales plan. This is really interesting. The cheapest sales, the, the, the cheapest client acquisition is the clients you already have, the customers you already have. And a lot of business owners don't take enough advantage of this. Do I have a system of how I'm going to reach the people I've already done business with? Or do I completely miss that one? That's literally the lowest hanging fruit in my business are people I've already established a relationship with. Versus having to spend all the money and resources to establish a new relationship. Right? That's exhausting. Of course we need to do that too, but the point is more to really grow in profitability means I continue to resell and re-engage with the people that are already loyal to my business. Whether I have a new product I need to let them know about in my newsletter for that month, or a special referral discount, whatever it might be, how do I continue that conversation with people I started the conversation with? A lot of people don't think about that one. So hopefully you're checking off in, in, in your own scorecard which of these systems do you have and which ones don't you have. And here's what you'll see, like we talked about a second ago. Each element of the stack increases the odds of hitting your profit by 6.6% each on average. right? So if I do five of these times 6.6%, 35%, whatever that's going to be, of hitting my profit, for my profit targets for, for my business. So these are the nine best practices that will give you a 60% greater odds of actually reading your goals, your target goals. So just to think about, you know, am I doing three of these? Am I doing one of these? Am I doing none of these? How many are, how many are doing, um, we'll go back to that page here, how many are doing half of them? How many are doing more than half? One? Okay. You must be an Emith client. Have we worked together? Okay. You look familiar. Um, how many are doing like two of them, a couple of them? Okay, good. That's, that's actually a big head start. How many have one of them? Got, they, they got one down. Okay, good. So room to grow and at least you know now where to put attention in your business that these things actually translate to real results, not just academic stuff. This is real result stuff. Okay. This is kind of interesting. Um, so we, once again, I can have values, but it doesn't actually translate in my business. We'll talk about that in a second. So we found the, the people that we surveyed, 85% have defined company values of these companies. But 70%, uh, only 70% actually use their values when they hire. So a lot of times they're actually not demarcating um, you know, who would be a good brand fit to hire. How would I know that? Do they have similar values to our business? You know, are they self-responsible? Do they have integrity? Whatever my values are, I should want that in my employees. Or there's going to be a big problem in my company culture down the road. right? So you can start to see where the values actually start uh, dissipating through the expression of the business. And that we found only 44% of employees use values to make decisions in the business. What, do you, what is that actually telling you? When you read those st stats, what is that telling you about what's happening in the business? What, you, what would you guess? Lack of commitment. Mm -hmm. Yep. So lack of buy-in maybe, lack of commitment. There's some way that the leadership is not carrying forward the values in a way that, that involves the employees. Maybe there's a lot, not a lot of employee involvement. That could be a big issue also. Is somehow they're still not bought in. Lack of communication is huge. Um, do you have good management where if one of your employees is not actually embodying your value, are you in helping them? Are you mentoring them? You know, that kind of thing. So I'm going to whiz through these. We only have about seven minutes or so left, so I'm just going to kind of go through this fast here. So if you want control of your business, which was your question earlier, here's the three things we found to, to focus on the most. So you might want to take note. To have written values, an ideal customer profile, and role descriptions. These are the fastest ways we found with uh, metrics if you want control of your business. If you want profits, if that's the most important thing for you, 
the, these highlighted numbers are the ones that are the most important. So having a written marketing plan is actually very important, but interestingly enough, if you want profit, sell to the people who have already bought from you. That's by far the, most, the lowest hanging fruit in your business. So th these are the uh, metrics for profits to focus on. And by the way, if you email me, I'll pass out my business cards at the end. If you email me, I can give you the full report for free. So you can see the whole report. You're just seeing the highlights. But if you want to actually read the whole report, it's really interesting. And you can also go to stateoftheowner.com and get it that way too. Revenue growth. If you're, so if you want revenue growth, not necessarily profits, but you need revenue. Here's what to focus on. So interesting, if you're a business to business, if you sell to other businesses or work with other businesses, repeat sales plan is also the most important. If you directly just serve con uh, consumers or clients, then ideal knowing who your client is is actually the most important factor for revenue growth. Okay, so what should you do now? Because hopefully you're starting to think about and translate this to your real business. So this is putting it all into action. So if you need to get started, if you're new, if you're a startup, the place to start is I need to start with my vision and my values. This would be the place to start. If I'm, if I'm new or in the, in the first few months of infancy of my business. If I need control, here's the things I need to focus on. If, I'm, if, I, if I feel overwhelmed in my business, here's a place I need to turn to right away. Come back to my values, what's our guiding principle, um, what's my, who's my ideal customer, and my role descriptions within my business, including for myself. Do I need happiness? Maybe I just don't enjoy what I do after a few years. And coming back to, once again, why am I in business in the first place? What should I really be doing in my business? And how do I actually take advantage of the people that already I do business with? Okay, if you need profits, repeat sales plan, revenue plan, and ideal customer profile. This will help you, your business become more profitable and a higher performance. And lastly, if I need revenue, if that's what my business needs the most out of all of these and if what I need the most, then I need to focus on my ideal customer, my marketing plan, metrics, and my repeat sales. This will bring in the cash more than anything. So hopefully this has given you guys some ideas of what to put attention on and how you can do that in your business. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.